The Lord be with you. Welcome this morning to our video matin service. This is the Feast of the Holy Trinity, uh, and um, today we, we recite the Athanasian Creed, uh, as is our custom. We'll do that responsively. Everything you'll need for worship should be on your screen. We begin with our opening hymn. Deep places of the earth. 
whoever desires to be saved must, above all, hold the Catholic faith. Whoever does not keep it whole and undefiled will, without doubt, perish eternally. And the Catholic faith is this, that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance. For the Father is one person, the Son is another, and the Holy Spirit is another. But the Godhead of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit is one, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. Such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Spirit. The Father uncreated, the Son uncreated, the Holy Spirit uncreated. The Father infinite, the Son infinite, the Holy Spirit infinite. The Father eternal, the Son eternal, the Holy Spirit eternal. And yet, there are not three eternals, but one eternal. Just as there are not three uncreated or three infinites, but one uncreated and one infinite. In the same way, the Father is almighty, the Son almighty, the Holy Spirit almighty. And yet, there are not three almighties, but one almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and yet there are not three gods, but one God. So the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit is Lord, and yet there are not three lords, but one Lord. Just as we are compelled by the Christian truth to acknowledge each distinct person as God and Lord, so also are we prohibited by the Catholic religion to say that there are three gods or lords. The Father is not made, nor created, nor begotten by anyone. The Son is neither made nor created, but begotten of the Father alone. The Holy Spirit is of the Father and of the Son, neither made, nor created, nor begotten, but proceeding. Thus there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits. And in this Trinity, none is before or after another, none is greater or less than another. But the whole three persons are co-eternal with each other and co-equal, so that in all things, as has been stated above, the Trinity in unity and unity in Trinity is to be worshipped. Therefore, whoever desires to be saved must think thus about the Trinity. But it is also necessary for everlasting salvation that one faithfully believe the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is the right faith that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is at the same time both God and man. He is God, begotten from the substance of the Father before all ages, and he is man, born from the substance of his mother in this age perfect God and perfect man, composed of a rational soul and human flesh, equal to the Father with respect to his divinity, less than the Father with respect to his humanity. Although he is God and man, he is not two, but one Christ. One, however, not by the conversion of the divinity into flesh, but by the assumption of the humanity into God. One altogether not by confusion of substance, but by unity of person. For as the rational soul and flesh is one man, so God and man is one Christ, who suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, rose again the third day from the dead, ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father God Almighty, from whence he will come to judge the living and the dead. At his coming all people will rise again with their bodies, and give an account concerning their own deeds. And those who have done good will enter into eternal life, and those who have done evil into eternal fire. This is the Catholic faith. Whoever does not believe it faithfully and firmly cannot be saved. Amen. <laughs>
reading from Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. A reading from Romans chapter 11. O the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments! and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. A reading from John chapter 3. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens.
unto the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. Those who claim to perfectly know the mysteries of God or God's hidden will should be viewed with far more suspicion than we reserve for just about anybody else. They should be counted as heretics. If you want to know the charge, the heresy is called uh, rationalism. But they should be counted as heretics and avoided as such. In particular here, you should be alert to those who claim to know all the details of the very end. You hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. Nicodemus was a teacher of Israel but he did not know nearly what he pretended to know. Beware of teachers, charismatic ones and non-charismatic ones alike. Beware of teachers who claim to know more than they should. Stick to the scriptures and to the creeds. Test the spirits to know whether they are from God or not. For many false prophets have gone into the world by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. Trust not in princes. Trust not in bureaucrats or candidates. Beware those who call for trust. Trust God and his promises. Test to see if the Spirit is from God or not by checking to see whether the Spirit is confessing that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. The test for biblical orthodoxy is simply the test for Christology. Does it confess Christ? So beware of those who claim to know more than the Bible says. Beware of those who claim to know, have put together the dots that the rest of the Christian church for 2,000 years hasn't. But beware of the other side, too. Beware of the mystics. Beware of those who put on a fake profundity and trade in ambiguity. Beware of those who sound like they're saying something really profound, but then when you investigate it, it's nothing at all. It's clouds and smoke. Beware of those who say you cannot know God. And be very, very wary of those who say things like, well, I can't be too dogmatic about things because after all, nobody has it right. Avoid those people like mad. And they are everywhere. God is knowable because his word is knowable and that's where he reveals himself. Doctrine, which comes from the Bible, is confessible. We are able to confess the truth about God. The Athanasian Creed is long, and rightly so. And every bit of it, every word, has been tested, whether it comports with the Holy Scriptures or not. And I'm pleased to tell you that it does, in fact, comport with the entirety of the Holy Scriptures. Nicodemus feigned ignorance of what the Lord meant by telling him that no one can see the kingdom of God unless he had been born again. Nicodemus was a liar who was trying to avoid accountability for his teaching. For the mystery of the Holy Trinity, just like the mystery of the Incarnation, just like the mystery of God's love for us in Christ, is not a secret. It is a mystery, yes. A secret remains a secret as long as you don't know it. But once you know it, the secret is gone. 
A mystery, however, remains a mystery even when it is revealed. And don't let anyone abuse that word for you. The word mystery simply means we could never know it unless God revealed it to us. So the Trinity is a mystery. We can know it, but we're not going to learn it by science. We're not going to learn it by philosophy. We're only going to know the Trinity because God reveals himself as triune. The incarnation, the fact that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man, is a mystery. That means we could never know it unless he revealed it, but he revealed it. That's what the word mystery means. It simply means something that God had to reveal to us for us to know it. And once it's revealed to us, it's still a mystery. That means we still can only know it if God reveals it to us. The Trinity would never be known by means of science or philosophy or even just sitting down and trying to think through it. The Trinity is hidden from our sight. He confounds our reason in a sense. That the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and yet there are not three gods but one God. It confounds our reason, but that doesn't mean that it's unknown. We do know it. We can know it. And it's not arrogant to say so. Because it's what he has revealed to us. He's, he's revealed himself to us in the scriptures, which we have and we read and we study and we know. We can know him and we do confess him. And we not only should, but we must for whoever desires to be saved must, above all, worship the one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance. And we care about being saved, so we must confess thus. Confessing the Trinity is kind of like trying to describe the mystery of music. We can experience and know the strange sinking of brain and heart and emotion and even the bodies of musicians who perform together. We should recognize that music is something greater than ourselves that we participate in. In a similar way, we can know the affection and bond that a couple who has been married for a long time enjoys. Music and love are knowable. They are confessible, but they're also mysterious in their own way because we can't fully understand them. We can't fully explain them. There are parts that we kind of know by experience, but can't really give good words for. And any attempt to describe that, that sort of thing, music or the bond of a long married couple, any attempt to put it into words is always going to fall flat there is no analogy to describe exactly what they're like. All of those fall flat as well. But they're not secrets. We don't need to resort to mumbo jumbo and Facebook quotes done up to look like they're really deep thoughts to try to describe them. And when it comes to the Holy Trinity, it is far more serious than music or the love of husband and wife. Not that those things don't call for reverence, they do. But the Holy Trinity, of course, is infinitely greater. He demands reverence. We need to confess the Trinity whom we worship, and we need to confess him precisely, even if the math does not add up for us. Reverence requires us to speak carefully respectfully, in humility, and at the same time, though we might be awed at the whole thing, reverence also calls us to joy. Because think of what we're describing when we describe the Holy Trinity. Think of what we're confessing when we say the Athanasian Creed. We're not just describing a beautiful supernova or a bird of paradise or a wonderful symphony. We're not describing something that is wonderful but very distant. We are describing the God whom we worship, and in describing him, we are worshiping him. And this is not just any God. This is not some distant being who doesn't know us. This is the God who has loved us by sending his Son. 
If you insist on subduing the doctrine to all of your reason and geometry, then the Holy Trinity will forever frustrate you. It will, be, it will become an exercise in frustration and ultimately ego. What is called for here is reverence. Reverence calls us to embrace with humility the simple reality that there are things that we do not fully comprehend, such as where the wind blows, but we nonetheless know and benefit from. The wind pollinates and waters the earth. It brings fresh air to us. It provides a multitude of benefits we rarely consider. And so it is with the Holy Trinity. We can confess the Trinity in unity and the unity in Trinity, and we should. We should speak of the Father's love for his beloved Son, from which proceeds the Holy Spirit. But here is more than all. Here, dear Christian, is joy. The Holy Trinity was never at any time incomplete or never in any need. He did not need someone to love because the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit love one another perfectly. They are satisfied and complete and always have been. And yet, the Trinity chose to, to create us in love and for love and to bring us into himself even after we rebelled against him in sin. And even long before he formed us in our mother's wombs, he knew us. Greatest of all mysteries, it seems, is not just the Trinity, not just the Incarnation, but the mystery that God knows fully who we are, not just the hairs on our head, but all the inner thoughts of our mind and heart, the ones we don't even like to admit to ourselves. He knows all of them. And even knowing all of that, knowing how we would treat his son when he sent him into the world, knowing how we would rebel against his law, knowing all of that, he still, still loves us. He still wants us. He still sacrificed his son to win us back to himself. He even loves Nicodemus. The reason why baptism is a major theme for the fe Feast of the Holy Trinity is because today we also consider the Trinitarian name, the name into which we are baptized. Note carefully the name of the Trinity, which is not a formulation that was invented by the church. They come straight from the words of our Lord in the last chapter of Matthew. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name, singular one name, the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We did not invent the name of the Trinity, even though we invented the word Trinity to describe it. He gave us the name, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Note carefully what kind of name that is. That name is love. It's relational. It's not functional. Despite the attempts of unbelieving church bodies to try to say otherwise, he did not name himself creator, redeemer, and sanctifier. He names himself father, which is a relational word. It shows love, that he has someone to love. And the Son, the Beloved, the one whom he loves, and who loves the Father, and the Spirit, who proceeds from the Father and the Son in love. And he brings into that name, that one name, he brings into his family in baptism and loves us with a love that holds nothing back and asks for nothing in return. Because that's who God is. He is love. And because he is love, he loves. This is how the Father loved the world that hated him. He sent his only begotten, his beloved Son, into our flesh to be tortured and killed by crucifixion. And he did that as the reconciliation price for our sins so that whoever believes in him does not perish but receives eternal life. 
That kind of love, dear Christian, is also a mystery. We know it's true. It's absolutely true because God's word says so. But we can't begin to understand a love like that. We simply must confess it, even if we don't understand it. Because there the Spirit is blowing in a mystery that is beyond our comprehension. But just because it's beyond our comprehension does not mean that it's beyond our knowing. We can know it. There is the mystery that bestows joy in submission to God and does not grow less by revealing. There's also the mystery of the gospel itself, of the inner heart of the Holy Trinity and the essence of God, which is love. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of God? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.
Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Almighty God, by your grace alone, we are called into your kingdom to confess the true faith, to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity, and in the power of the divine majesty, to worship the true unity. We beseech you that you would keep us steadfast in this faith and evermore defend us from all adversities. For you, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, live and reign, one true God, now and forever. Amen. O Almighty Lord God, who breakest the power of the oppressor and stillest the noise and tumult of the rabble, stir up thy great strength, we beseech thee, and come to help us. Scatter the counsels of them that secretly devise mischief, and do thou bring the dealings of the violent to naught. Cast down the unjust from high places, and cause the unruly to cease from troubling. Allay all envious and malicious passions, and subdue the haters and evildoers, that our land may have rest before thee, and that all the people may praise thee, our help and our shield, both now and evermore. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by your governance, may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.